Well, we want to welcome you to the Reformed Informants. This is a podcast devoted to biblical exposition, systematic theology, and practical application for the good of the church. I'm Lance Burroughs, along with TJ Darty, and we are the Reformed Informants. Did you see this laptop Yeah, case? You, look, you look real good over there. I didn't even notice that earlier. Yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, it's very colorful. Can, and, you, uh, can you explain who that is? I think there's some flowers is? on here. No, I bought it for me. <laughs> no. no, my wife has actually let me borrow her laptop. What a, what I've a got man. to pull up the episode guide. Of course. But now I'm going to take the beating in the comment section. Uh, because, of course. Because I'm what I'm rocking up here. Yeah, we, we want <laughs> feedback. We want honest feedback, and so be it. If that includes... Uh, Letting Lance know what you think about his laptop case. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Well, in, in all seriousness, let me take a moment to plug and say thank you, Lance, for being the guy who does all the behind-the-scenes stuff. Lance is the guy that makes it all happen on the technological side. I show up. I record. Um, I, will, I go home, and I listen just like everybody else. Yeah. Um, I don't have to do all that stuff. And anyway, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. You're, well, you're a heck of a guy. When I got out of church yesterday, TJ had texted me and made a comment about, dude, what is up with the YouTube videos? They sound so echoey. Yeah, they sound, yeah, they sound bad. That's yeah. what I wanted to say. Yeah, they, they, yeah what yeah. did you say? I don't what remember. Yeah, I think I said echoey. Yeah. yeah. I said, hey, I don't know what's going on, but uh, yeah, had to had to go right back to the source and yeah. get that sorted out. But you got it fixed, right? I got it fixed, okay. yeah. Good. My, my editing is slowly cleaning up and getting better. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, we're going to jump right into this episode. Timer's on. Uh, we want to be efficient and effective. Uh, we're picking back up in our theology proper uh, series. Um, and we did this with bibliolo- bibliology. We, we kind of threw in a, um, I don't know what we call like a half episode or an episode that we're kind of throwing into the mix maybe that we didn't originally plan. So you want to kind of tell us about that? And Yeah, I think that's a good way of saying it. You have these systematic Approaches. We're build, we're putting together these building blocks, like we did it with bibliology. We had those episodes on revelation, um, authority, sufficiency, all of those things. But then we stopped in the middle and took a biblical passage that addressed some of those things and said, "Hey, this is where we get some of the some of the ideas." And we tried to walk through the text, showed the connection between systematic theology and biblical exegesis, right? Yeah, and. In, in the same way, we want to do that, and I don't know if we'll be able to do that with every single um, series of, or doctrine of, of systematic theology, but it certainly applies here. We're walking through theology proper. We look at um, the, the being of God, the names of God, the attributes of God, uh, the personhood of God in Trinity, right? Three persons, um, one essence, I believe is the last episode we did. And, uh, well, even, and then after that, we began... Um, looking at the work of God, yeah. right? We looked at creation. Yeah, that's yeah, that's where we left off. Yes, we talked creation, about creation mm-hmm. and providence. That's actually when we had Josh in the studio. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a, they're all blurring together because we we I get so excited <laughs> thinking about all these things. So after creation, um, we're we're going to talk about um, the divine decrees. But before we jump into that, it makes sense to actually take a biblical passage that deals with creation and walk through some of the questions associated with it. Well, and uh, yeah. And I think we've mentioned Genesis one and two so often yeah. throughout the podcast yeah. that it's time that we actually look at Genesis right. one and two. And of course this will in no way be exhaustive. It will in no way, um, adequately answer or deal with all of the, uh, the biblical exposition here. Um, but, there are several there are several related topics and questions uh, within the doctrine of creation that we don't want to get bogged down with, right? Like we've got all these questions about the age of the earth or um, you know, you know, what, what about those days in Genesis 1 or, or the order of creation or the co- connection with evolution and science and cre- all of those things. And we just kind of push pause on our doctrinal building blocks and stop to answer those questions by looking at the text. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, what... No, that was a good introductory what, right there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. With that yeah, in mind, good Lance... good introductory comments ta- there. Take, take this from us. Keep... Let, let, let's... I want to ask you, what do we need to think about when it comes to Genesis 1, creation? What are some... Um, I don't know, some thoughts or, or things that we need to put on the table up front before we yeah. start to have a discussion and a dialogue about it. Yeah, well, hopefully for those that are following along and listening episode by episode, 
one of the practical things that we're trying to do is build a biblical worldview. Mm. Sure, we want to study systematic theology. Sure, we want to exposit different portions of Scripture. But we also want to practically apply those things and help build a framework of how we view reality or how we view the world. So when you come to creation, man, you've got two worldviews that are, man, butting heads, colliding, exploding Mm. uh, with one another. Uh, What what are those two worldviews just— to kind of flesh that out, like what, when you say you've got two that are coming head on with one another, what are you what are you referencing? Yeah, in terms of a Christian worldview and a cultural uh, secular worldview, and when you come to creation, you're looking at what Scripture says about creation, or what science and the world um, hypothesize uh, essentially uh, about creation. So. Um, yeah, we want to help develop a biblical worldview, and we want mm. to start that in Genesis 1. Uh, I think another comment that I would add uh, before we get going um, would be, in, in terms of studying creation, there wasn't one human eyewitness, right? No, no one was there. That's sobering. Okay, right? right? Sci- science would say that, okay? S- so would we, mm. biblically speaking. So if there weren't any eyewitnesses, Christianity will land on the side of God being the witness, the founder, uh, the the builder uh, of this world. So we want to rest on his revelation, kind of like what we've talked about with general and special revelation. I say all that to say we want to say that creation isn't scientific, uh, that creation is theological. In other words, creation can't be observed. Um, science and the scientific math- method demand observation, but it, but it can't be observed. It can't be repeated. Yeah, it can't be repeated. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to argue that creation is theological. It's a theological yeah. issue I, uh, that yeah. we want to deal with. I think No, I think that's an outstanding starting point for us to consider as we approach the text. Um, we are not coming to Genesis 1 with our, you know, beaker and goggles on, right, going into the lab. What right. we are doing is we're dealing with the revealed Word of God. Yeah. And it's this is a grace that has been given to us in Genesis 1. Um, and and I, have, I haven't even really dwelled on this much, but to think about what you just mentioned— God could the, the story could have started with Adam's eyes opening and looking around and observing all that's around him, right? Like he could have, if he's writing Genesis 1, which we know that Moses has written this, um, or at least has put together all of the documents and put it in their, in their final form, but the pen could have started with eyes are open, observing, there are these, these creatures, there's sky, land, whatever else, but God gives the story to man so that we might have an understanding of the beginning. Yeah. We don't have to ask these hypothetical questions. We don't have to theorize, hypothesize. Um, we don't have to come up with our best conjecture. God has given creation to us, and what he has given, we are responsible to understand. Yeah, Genesis 1 and 2 is God's testimony of mm-hmm. how he created all things. That's so right? good. That's what yeah. we want to rest on, like you said. Yeah. That's the foundation. That's that's the cornerstone that's of our belief on creation. Yeah. And and one final observation about that yeah. is this is from God's perspective, right? Like this that's a really um, important um, I don't know, angle to kind of bring this in, that this is not written from the first person view of the guy who got created. Yeah. Right? Like this is not Adam telling a story. This is God telling the story from his perspective, from the um, eternal perspective over top of the sovereign, um, distinct perspective where God says, let there be and things are. Like, like Adam doesn't have any clue what's going on here. This is all before he comes into sure. the picture. This is God's story. Uh, and so it is a theological story. It's yeah. not, it's his story. It's not um, scientific scientific observation. So okay. That's good. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, so let's jump through some of these questions that we have here. Uh, first off, uh, we've, I think we made the point that Genesis 1 is important, but, but how does that relate to um, uh, Jesus' words, uh, the Old Testament, really all of Scripture? Uh, what, what does all of Scripture say about Genesis 1? Why, why is that important? 
Wow. Um, well, you, you're welcome. You've made that. Yeah, sure. Just set it up. Set it up. Let me try to unpack this thing. Right. You you've made this observation. We've repeated it a ton. Um, what is what did you steal from MacArthur one time that when you open the Bible yeah, to test. Genesis one? We're, we're faced with the test right here. Every time we Every open time. the Bible, do we believe that God in fact created? Right. Like that's a that's a question we have to ask. I've heard it stated this way: If you can believe Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You believe that, the rest of the Bible is easy to believe because right. th- it follows. Okay, God created. Now, what did he do with his creation? Um, so Genesis 1-1 becomes this litmus test for do you submit to the, th- to the thought, to the reality that God is, in fact, sovereign over his creation, that right. God has in- indeed created. Yeah, a little, right? a little side note to that. Now that you mentioned John MacArthur at, at the Master's University and the Master's Seminary, I, I don't think, and I think I read this right, but I don't think that they will allow anybody on staff or faculty that doesn't affirm a literal six-day creation wow. be, because of the point that he, that you were, you were mm-hmm. making right there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we, we can't budge on this, that, man. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is important. I've heard people say, oh, I don't want to die on this hill because it's not the gospel. That's fine. I, I understand that mentality. But the point that we're trying to make is that this is the word of God. This has been revealed to us, and we are going to take it seriously because it sets up how we view and understand the rest of Scripture. right? And in fact, Jesus says so in John chapter 5. right? He says, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. Because he wrote of me, but you don't believe his writing, so how are you going to believe my words? That's John chapter 5. So... Moses' writing here in, in Genesis 1 is foundational for how we approach and understand the rest of biblical revelation, right? Yeah, if we're Genesis, willing to take that seriously. Yeah, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 is equal with what Jesus is saying, mm-hmm. right? Right. Like, you, 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 you take all of revelation, not just part of it. Man, I love that from John 5, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that's a classic text to go to on Jesus equating his own words with God breathed scripture. Right. Um what you I mean, what you got there? I, I was just reading today in Luke chapter okay. sixteen, the rich man and Lazarus, yeah, and you've got the, go. the chasm between the two. And uh this man, um he says he, he cries out um to have someone go to his father's house and tell and warn them right. about what's to come, about this eternal torment. And and Abraham says to him, he says they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he says, no, if someone will go to them from the dead, they will repent. And he says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Mm. So, in other words, we must take this word so seriously because if we don't, we are, in effect, setting ourselves up to reject what is to yeah. follow. Yeah. Right? So this is foundational. Um this is foundational to what the rest of the Bible has to say. Yeah, if you don't believe Genesis one, where where do we start? Right, right. If Genesis one isn't good enough, right, for you, then then where do you start? Yeah, you just pick it up in Genesis fourteen. Yeah, or, it's, you know. of course. Okay, let me let me ask this question. So <clears throat> let's say, um, let's say I'm listening. I I affirm. I'm not really sure what you guys are talking about. I do believe Genesis one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So now I, I believe that Genesis chapter one is true. It's from the Word of God, but Here's my struggle. I grew up um, in 21st century America. I went to school in the public school system. I have been taught scientific theory. I've been taught the these thoughts of uh, evolution. And so when I go back and I've been taught the earth is millions and billions and billions of years old and the universe and yada, yada, yada. The list goes on. Okay, that's where I, That's my worldview. But I still believe the Bible. How am I supposed to reconcile this? Because what I've done is I've tried to read this and go, well, how does this timeline fit? How does it, how do they work together? How do I understand these days Um, in Genesis 1? How can we walk through this in a way that makes sense and adequately addresses some of those issues? That is a loaded question. Of course it is. Yeah, I'll turn that back over to you. Do do I need to? I appreciate that. Okay, let me, let me try to simplify just for your sake. What different perspectives or theories are there to try to reconcile those two perspectives? Yeah, well, again, it goes back to where we started talking about worldviews, the, the scientific community, uh, secular society, the culture is going to argue for billions and billions of years that uh, this world 
uh, essentially began from a big bang or an explosion, mm -hmm. um, which has now trickled into schools, high schools, universities. Uh, basically, everybody's indoctrinated with That's that, right? right? Um, unless you are, yeah, unless you're at a private school or homeschooled. Um, or, or you've just been taught, you know, right. through the church or this whatnot. Is, that's the assumed perspective. That's the assumed reality. And to reject that is to be, you're, you're in the minority. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That is the, I mean, that's basically the standard teaching yes. at this point. Mm -hmm. So if you've been indoctrinated with that year after year, you've been hit in the head with that. And then you come to scripture, I, man, that's just a flat out contradiction. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the two don't meet together. The two actually hit and bounce off of one another in complete opposite directions. Um, so uh, the other perspective uh, would be uh, a, a six-day literal uh, creation, a okay. uh, 24-hour period, and just like we would argue for our own days mm -hmm. now. Um, so you've got those two conflicting worldviews colliding, coming to a head. Yeah. Um, th so if I hold to the literal 24 hour days, and we're going to get into what that word means and kind of walk through some of the biblical text here. But if I hold to that, how old does the Bible, uh, taking that thread of the 24 hour days, how old does the Bible suggest that the earth would be? If yeah. you're, if you're going to give me a ballpark, if I'm going to give you a ballpark, you said, I, you said it's not billions of years. Yeah. You can't get billions of years from the scripture. Okay. We'll, we'll just put Thank it that you. way. Yeah. Okay. So if you, if you want to try and determine the age of the earth outside of the scripture, uh, well, there's really no end. Right. And there's really no way to actually determine that. But basing it on scripture alone, which is what we want to argue and demonstrate, um, I think conservative scholars have estimated that the age of the earth is anywhere from six to 10,000 years old. Um, I think there was even one scholar uh, many years ago that tried to at least date uh, creation <laughs> in 4004 BC, mm -hmm. um, basing that off of genealogies that you find throughout scripture and right. how old people were. And those things are documented mm -hmm. specifically in Genesis chapter five. Um, but we want to land on a young earth. That's yeah. Yeah. We, we think that the overwhelming stance or the overwhelming argument of scripture is that the earth is relatively young right. and would fall anywhere from about six to 10,000. Were you hoping I was going to give those numbers there? I, those are the, those are the two numbers that I wanted you to give. Okay. Uh, 6,000 is, is essentially if you take the genealogies with the ages and dates from history that we can affirm, yeah. you're going to get to 6,000. But there are some who would argue, well, there are cases in scripture where perhaps generations are skipped. Yeah, and that's okay. That's fine. We're totally we're fine not, with we're that. We're not arguing for a, like you mentioned, 4004 BC creation. And if you don't hold that, you're wrong. Like we're not giving a specific year. We're ballparking to say the earth is not billions of years old. The dinosaur fossils are not 75 million years old. Whenever that's just publicly, you're going to open up a news article, you're going to turn on your TV, and that's what you're going to see. That's just presumed, and we would reject that based on Scripture alone. Yeah. Um, now, there are those who are going to come to the text. Now, let, let's let's walk through real quick, yeah. just to give us a, um, a a little bit of a preview. Can you can you kind of give me the Cliff Notes version? What is Genesis 1 kind of walking? So Genesis, I'll start us. Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, God creates the heavens and the earth. Uh, the earth was without form. There's darkness. Spirit of God's hovering over. And then on the first day, something happens. What does God do on day one? Yeah, God says, let there be light. Yep. Right? So, so light comes in. He set, God separates the light from the darkness. He calls the light day. The darkness he calls night. There was evening, there was morning, the first day. Yeah. So that's day one documented there, yeah. right? Um, day two, what yeah, happens? Well, yeah, well, you see uh, throughout the rest of chapter one, uh, that same pattern, right? God speaks, God creates, and then the context of the narrative tells us evening and morning were day two. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we get to day three, same thing, brief narrative, evening and morning were Day three. Right. Okay. And he rolls, and the text that's all rolls through. One is. That's right. The text rolls through day day two. Um, you have 
um, the sky right is, is formed. There's yep. an expanse between the waters. He separates the waters from mm-hmm. the waters, and he calls um, the expanse heaven. And so there's evening and morning, and so that's the second day. Day three, he gathers the waters um, on the earth into one place, and he lets so he he creates oceans and dry land together, right and um, that's day three. He calls the, the ocean seas and the dry land he calls earth. Uh, day four, here come all the plants, all the vegetation, um, all the seed that comes with that. That's day four. Um, he also, um, no, sorry, that's day three. That comes with the land. Um, day four is the lights of the heavens and the skies. So this is the sun, the moon, yeah, the verse stars. 16, yeah. Right. Um, day five. You've got the uh, birds of the air. You've got the fish of the sea. Um, all of those are created on day five. Day six is all the land animals and then humans, right? right. Man comes into creation. Yeah. So that's that's how creation lays out in six days that it's just put forward, right, in the text. That's all we have from the text. We've we've essentially covered what the text says in chapter right. one. Now, I, I flew through that, but... Well, a special work of God, but a very just brief general overview of creation that we get here, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Nothing difficult to understand. Right. I don't think that the language is difficult at all. Now, yep. I'm no Hebrew scholar, but I can tell here in English that this is clear, this is straightforward, that even the youngest of kids would be able to work their way through Genesis 1. And I think it's done that way on purpose. Yeah. Well, clearly. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, clearly, uh, right, 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 right. But with an intentionality for right. this reason. Um, but before we come to our argumentation, because I think the case for the literal 24-hour days is strong, and I want to walk through that. But let I, I want to at least mention some of the other theories or uh, attempts to deal with Scripture. Okay. Okay. So, which one immediately comes to mind? Maybe the most popular. This is the one that um, we see most frequently in terms of how do I understand the days in order to reconcile that with the millions of years of science. Yes, yeah. uh, we would call that the day age theory. Okay. Okay. So, w- what we mean by that is that for each one of the six days that we see in Genesis chapter one. Those days aren't literal 24-hour days, but instead those days represent a specific age or an extended time. Okay. Now, again, I I, I don't think that that's what the Scripture teaches, Mm -hmm. but that's what you run into, like you previously said, when you try and harmonize the biblical text and what you've been enamored with in the culture and in schooling for Mm-hmm. Year after year, so the day age theory we want to reject that right, outright. Right, right, right. Well, but, what you so we think about our human our hermeneutics discussion, right? We had the analogy of faith. Scripture interprets scripture. We go, um, we let scripture be the guide, and the more clear text interprets the 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 more ambiguous text, so on and so forth. Well, in the day age theory, what we have is science is now interpreting the text. We've we've brought an observation from outside of Scripture and now brought that in because we, quote-unquote, know, using finger quotes here, we know that the earth is... We capture that millions. In the of, yeah, check, check that on video. <laughs> that the earth is millions of years old or billions of years old. So therefore, this must mean these are prolonged periods of time. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a classic case of eisegesis, Mm -hmm. not exegesis. I am reading into the text something that isn't in the text. That is the opposite of what we talked about in the Mm -hmm. hermeneutics episode. Exactly. And if if I don't have a clear reason from the text to do that, I don't have the, the ability, the authority, the right to actually interpret something any way other than its plain literal meaning. Right. right. So that's the day age theory. That's the most prominent one. That's the one you're going to see many um, Bible believing. I know many friends who are reformed, who are solid, who I would I would l- welcome to preach in my church any day of the week, and they would hold to this. And I love them and gently say, I think you're wrong. Right. Because I don't think it adequately deals with Genesis chapter one. Um, no, I I think we can demonstrate that. Yes. Very easily. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the day-age theory, I mean, that's almost becoming uh, the overwhelming 
um, the overwhelming belief amongst Christians now. It is. For, for some reason, it, I it's think. It's almost like this default, right? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's the default because um, I, I think it's just easier to go ahead and um, appease uh, the science community and, I don't know, kind yeah. of blend together the science and the text. Um well, I think it, I, I think know. it has. I, I just don't like. I just can't be. I, the reason I'm not swayed on it is because I think it's too easy of a text to read and understand to right. not right. believe a, a right. day age. Theory. Well, I think there's a noble intention here, right? Like we're trying to yeah. adequately. We're trying not to su- suggest that oh, all this scientific data is is useless and faulty. Although there's plenty of inconsistencies in the science. Like this is all conjecture. Like science is not, we, we slap that label on it as if it's fact, like, hey, this is provable, it's demonstrative, but you made the point earlier, you can't observe or repeat creation. Right. You can't observe or repeat. So that's an issue for science, it, right? Right. So, the, so in other words, science is inadequate. It's unable to properly deal with the issues in play here. So yeah. there are a lot of assumptions. There's some circular reasoning. It's impossible to prove. Um, we don't need to get into all the scientific detail there. That's not the point of this podcast. Um, but there are resources that might help shed some light on this. Um, the point, though, I think, is not so much in the weakness of the day age theory, but more in the strength of the literal right. 24-hour day. Yeah, so let's talk about some of that. Yeah, that's a great way of, uh, of, of putting that. I think yeah. there's just a strength in the text taken at face value. Right. Yeah. And, and unless we have a reason to not do that, we should take it sure. at face value. We should, we should, this is the most natural way to read the text is to say, this was a 24 hour day. Yeah. Um, did I, you, did you want to talk about the gap theory or no? Well, le, yeah, let's mention the gap theory. I, I don't know that okay. I want to really break it down, yeah. but tell me what it well, is. Yeah, one of the other theories, and you'll see this in recent systematic theologies. Um, the, the gap theory is saying that in between Genesis one, verse one, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and verse two, that there's a, a gap of years. Uh, we don't know how many years took place in between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2, but there is a possibility that there was a gap, mm-hmm. right? So that's where the gap theory comes from. Now, again, that's an argument from silence. Right. There isn't any text in between right. verses 1 and 2. And that gap is supposed to solve the issues, right, of all the... Uh, geological evidence that has accrued over those years. But it, it, that in and of itself is inconsistent and um, it is, it's anachronistic with the rest of the creation story. Yeah. It's to suggest that these fossils, well, that may mean that, that something died before God created the things. Right. Like it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit the, it doesn't answer either of the questions, um, although it attempts to. It tries sure. to, it tries to solve that issue by an argument from silence, yeah. just kind of. A, but I don't think it has. It's it hasn't gained the scholarly consensus that I think it hoped to, and so for that reason, I don't think it's worth dwelling on. No. We're mainly going to deal with day age because this is what the common person in the church might think, because they've been indoctrinated to think that the Earth is millions and millions or billions of years old. Um, so, so let's. So, Let's talk about what else did you want to say? Anything no, else about no, gap theory? No, I, I was going to move us right yeah, along into the let's talk twenty-four about the, hour day. Let's talk theory. about those. Um, I think the strongest argument, like if uh, if you will just open up Genesis one and two, oh, open your Bible up at the table, at the desk, on your phone, and and you read it without imposing any outside ideas onto the text, you will only come away with one interpretation of the creation, and that is a six-day, literal six-day, 24-hour uh, period uh, creation. Yeah, because that's the most natural, organic. It is. Just it that, is. That if you read, that's the plain sense, if you read Genesis 1, you are forcing yourself to think of anything other than 24 hours. Right. What, what does day and night mean? It means day and night. Yeah. What does evening and morning mean? Right. It means I mean, it every, means that it got dark. It got light. Yeah. The natural way to use that type of language, mm-hmm. that type of terminology, is is only one way. Right. 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 So um, so that's the that's so if I'm building a case, that's point number one. 
right? Like that's the the first place I would go. That's the plain literal reading of the text. Um, because yeah, and I made the point earlier, and I I feel like I need to repeat it that if you don't do that in Genesis one, then when do you start doing that in the mm-hmm. Bible? Do you wait till the book of Joshua? Do you wait till uh, you get to uh, the book of Zechariah, or do you just wait till you get to the New Testament? Mm-hmm. Right? You have to decide to make that choice of reading it naturally. Genesis one verse one. Right. If 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 I reject some of this as um, symbolic or um, some other type of language other than the plain literal sense, then do I reject the literal creation of Adam? Well, if I reject the literal Adam by one man, sin came into the world, by another man, so also life through Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, um, Christ is equated or coming in as the new and better Adam. Well, if I reject the the original Adam, I've got a problem with Christ. Yeah, and, so, it, and then you have a problem with Romans chapter 5. Yeah, right. Right? How do, how do you deal with that text now? Um is is Paul somehow hallucinating a creation story, or right. you know, why is he even talking about that mm-hmm. if if he didn't believe in a literal interpretation right. of Genesis? Right. So I think that's a that's a good starting place, but that's not the only place we can okay. go. There's other arguments to support a literal twenty four hour twenty uh, four hour day, seven day week to start the year. Okay. Young 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 Earth and. The next place I think of going is that word day. Okay. What does that word day actually mean? Well, l- yeah, let me read from a couple of yeah. uh, the references here where it, this day um, is is used. And then I'll, I'll let the... Uh, Don't you uh, say uh, it. Don't say it. <laughs> I'll, I'll let TJ <laughs> Thank talk you. about the Hebrew there. <laughs> okay, so if you um, go to verse 5 of Genesis 1... God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. You can jump down to verse 8. Evening and morning were the second day. You can jump down to verse 13. Evening and morning were the third day. And I'm not going to do that for every day. Mm -hmm. But that is the pattern that you see for creation. Now, before we even get into the context, okay, let's just... Just the word. Yeah, let's talk about the word day day right let's focus on that first then we'll get into the context okay yeah so so tj take it here can can a that word day mean anything other than 24 hours right like can it be a an age or an indefinite indeterminate amount of time well that hebrew word uh yom has three meanings or three possible meanings in the hebrew language one is a 24 hour day okay that's what we would argue is the case here that's the most that's the most common that's the that's the default interpretation or translation of that word. The second is a 12-hour daytime. So if it says like day and night, that word yom might be there. It doesn't mean 24 hours. It only means 12. It means the the day period. Still the same thing. We still don't have indefinite amounts of time. The third way it's used uh, occasionally in the Old Testament is as the the day of the Lord. Okay. This is a, a, a future prophetic determination that's yet to come. It's indefinite. That's not 24 hours, okay. but it's not an indefinite amount of time in the sense that we would call the day-age theory. Now, anytime you, you read those references, the first day, the second day, the thir- anytime there's a numerical adjective attached to the word yom, it always, every other instance that we know in the Hebrew literature means 24 hours. Okay, so a majority of the time that you find this word yom in the Old Testament, it is used as a literal day. Yes. Okay. And every time it has a number attached to it numerically, okay. every time it always means Okay, so the first day. way in which we take the word yom here, day, would be a literal day. But then... To add to that, now we're bringing in a little bit of the context. It says day one or first day, second day, Mm -hmm. day two, right? Right, right. Um, Anything else you want to add to that? Not with day, but there's more context to look at. Yeah. What what else in the context clues us in to the fact that this is going to be 24 hours? Right. Well, yeah, back in verse 5. So the evening and the morning were Mm -hmm. the first day. So not only is day most of the time used in a literal one day sense. Not only does it say first day, but then it also says evening and morning, right? Again, <laughs> right. 
I, the, the clarity in which God has revealed his creation, I, I would say it could not be more clear uh, based on the text alone, right. exegesis, not eisegesis, right? right. Add to that. No, that's, I mean, I mean I, okay, uh, this is another thing, and, I, and we could, we're building a case, right? We're, we're putting together multiple arguments to, to, to do this, and you keep saying, rightly that there's this is just the play like i don't know how else to say it this is a a child could understand this well what's fascinating is is that throughout the history of the church this has been the consensus like when you read the reformers there's no argument they don't have a a full chapter in their systematic theologies on how to deal with the creation narrative like it's days it's six thousand year old earth like that's yeah. because that's straightforward from the text this has only recently been challenged with the outside influence of so-called scientific theory of course coming from the evolutionary boom um from darwinism that has forced um us to deal with with the genesis uh, narrative and some christians didn't know how to adequately deal with this and so they tried to you know, mold the two together and we've lost it. Um, right. But church history through just this kind of the guardrails that we use church history for has said, Hey, 24 hour days, uh, because that's the plain meaning. Right. That's how well, everybody has read it. Yeah. And, and not to go, go in a different direction here and talk about another event in Genesis, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, Noah and the flood, mm-hmm. a universal worldwide flood has always been the, view of the church up until the last right. couple hundred years. Which those things in and of themselves are not authoritative, th- that argument. But it's a warning sign that if for 1,800 years the yeah. church has, has consensus has stated something, and in the last 200 years it's like, oh, God finally showed us the light, and we've been wrong for all this time, that's, that's a warning to us. It doesn't mean in and of itself that that's authoritative, but that's something. That's a weight. There's weight to that argument. Um, what's another verse from not Genesis, but a um, another Moses verse that comes in the next book that helps affirm um, this idea of literal six days? We've talked about this before with the analogy of faith, right? Other passages coming in. Um, what other verse have, have we referenced before that comes that comes to mind? Yeah, Exodus chapter twenty, right. giving of the Ten Commandments when um, God is giving Moses the Ten Commandments. It, specifically dealing with the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath holy. Um, God says in Exodus twenty eleven, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Okay, so again, the understanding of the Sabbath for the nation of Israel was a reflection on uh, the creation week. God creating yeah. for six days and then resting on the seventh day. And I would also argue even um, with the year Sabbaths, work on the land for six years, Mm -hmm. take the seventh year off. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't think that that is any coincidence that we're we're talking about a a reflection and remembrance back on the creation week. I love, I love, there's an observation I came across as I was studying this in years past that I think is very powerful that speaks to this reality. And that is the way in which we measure time. Um, you think about a day. A day is based on the relationship between the earth and the sun. You've got sunrise, sunset, but the earth's rotating and the, the relationship. That's The day is built around that. In mm. 24 hours, the sun and the, and the earth um, have a relationship that makes the day happen. A month, in the same way, is built on this relationship between the earth and the moon. Like we have those lunar calendars, mm-hmm. like that's how we get our months. We don't, it's not arbitrary. The year, again, the relationship between the earth and the sun, this is the trip around the axis. So all of God's handiwork is being used to determine our measurements of time. But what other measurement of time do we have? We've got this thing called a week, <laughs> and there is nothing that happens in astronomy, there's nothing that happens in creation that indicate. Um, a seven day pass. So if, if we were just to be barbarians that came up, uh, you know, out of, or, or evolved from cavemen, well, they could maybe figure out days because sunrise, sure. sunset, they could figure yeah. out years because 
I mean, with astronomy, you could determine. Yes. That. You could not figure out. You would not ever uh, get why, a week. Why seven? Right. Why seven yeah. days? There's nothing that happens. That is actually um, a reflection of the created the the created order. The, that's that's why the Sabbath exists. Right. Because God created in this manner. Yeah. So I think that speaks yeah. powerfully to that. It does. And this is why the the day age theory. You can't weave that through. Uh, the Old Testament narrative. Okay, let's say that you do want to go with the day-age theory. Well, what do you do with your Exodus 2011? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you do with the nation of Israel keeping the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Or do they just keep it for an entire age? Right. Okay, well, no. Well, right. no. Uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's silly because the Old Testament narrative doesn't present the Sabbath that particular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what is... God creates in six days, he rests on the seventh day, and that is the the same manner in which we understand the rest of the Old Testament calendar. But is it to say that the first six days and the first rest day were indefinite periods, and now all of a sudden they're wrapped into one day? It, it's inconsistent. Right. Um, it doesn't fit. And so I think for all of those reasons, you put all of that together, and the weight of that argument is so strong that regardless of what science says, I'm building my case on Scripture. You know, that's um, one of the, the important observations that we need to make here is that of all the theories that are posed, the literal 24-hour day theory, the one we're holding to, they we go to Scripture to make our argument. We don't care what science says because right. Scripture is the foundation piece. Now, when Scripture is properly in place, all of science will ultimately fit in if we understand science correctly. Right. Right? Like, it's just, I believe we have a misunderstanding of science, but it's yeah. certainly not a misunderstanding of the text. Right. I don't want science to rule how I read the Bible. Rather, I need to understand what does the Bible say first, and then when I have those um, kind of pillars in place, I can start to deal with some of the scientific questions related to that. Right. And that's not our objective here. We're looking at the Bible. We're yeah. not concerned about yeah. You know, dating fossils. That's not that's not our task. Our task is just to deal with what the Bible says and not to be concerned about um, those those details related to evolutionary theory. Right. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, that's good. I mean, there's so much packed into creation um, that we could discuss. It just it just came to my mind as as you were talking there. Look, God, although He's using six days. And he, he's separating out what he creates during those six days. He's creating these things instantaneously, mm -hmm. right? But but we see that with Jesus in the New Testament when he's performing miracles, when he's turning water into wine, when he's calming the storm. We see Jesus with the same power over creation, right? Um, or or healing, sure, right? Like it's instantaneous healing. It's not okay. I've put you on the you know, this, this, uh, recovery plan. And over the next six months with physical therapy and whatever, right, you'll be right. healed. It's instant. Yeah. This that's is good. just, this is the character of the true on God that, because that's good. We see this type of creation of this creative power rather all throughout scripture. Second Peter three, he destroys this earth, mm -hmm. right? Incinerates it, burns it up. Revelation chapter 21 creates a new heaven and a new earth. So if the day age theory is true in Genesis one, well, does that mean that it takes ages for God to mm. destroy the world, and then ages for God to create a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation twenty one? Right. I mean, that's not consistent with what Scripture teaches. Well, and I love I love that observation, and that's by the way that's bonus material, right? Like that's, that's not bonus. Even, that's not even in our <laughs> our God here. Um, but but the creative power that comes from let there be. Right? Like, does God just sit around for a million years and then finally say, vegetation come into... Like, it doesn't... That doesn't fit the narrative. Right. It's inconsistent. And of course, we didn't even get into the inconsistencies of, of, well, the plants are made on day three and the sun doesn't come till day four. So if it's one day, the plants will be fine. Right? But if it's a million or a billion years between day yeah. three and day four, how do the plants survive without a sun? Right. The, 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 those things don't... Don't, don't fit. They don't line up. Um, That'll just be creation part two. Yeah, we get, we, we'd love to two. maybe do maybe an informal informants episode breaking down any of those things. Yeah. So, uh, which we have discussed the whether or not 
creation, Genesis 1, is compatible with the theory of evolution, we say no. Um, and we don't need to get into, again, all the details here, but, but the theory of evolution is completely backwards from yeah. the, the, the Genesis account, right? Like evolution puts reptiles first and birds evolving out of that. Well, we see in Genesis 1 that birds are created first, and then the reptiles come later as part of the um, the land animals on day six. Uh, birds are made on day five. Uh, evolution says that the sun comes first, and then the earth is created, and then the plants come into being, and it's the opposite in creation in Genesis chapter one. So you have all of this inconsistency. Uh, evolution says all the ocean life is created first, and the Bible says that land um the, the plants that are, are um, placed on day three on the land, those come first, right. not, not the ocean life. So there's inconsistency and incompatibility all around where we would say you can't hold to creation and evolution. Yeah, l- l- yeah. L- let me uh, make a comment on that, and I'm going to hear what you have to say on that. We go back to where we started with the worldviews, right? Biblical worldview, secular worldview in regards to man is man how is man viewed from a biblical mm. worldview how was mankind viewed from a secular worldview well the secular worldview man's not any better than you know the dog that i own mm-hmm. right but in the biblical worldview every single human being is made in the image of god Gosh, that's so good right yeah uh, like we have have right here, man is the crown jewel of creation. Yeah. Um, I mean, another important so factor into believing that God is creator, it, it explains mankind. It explains humanity. Um, yeah, that's man. that's so good. And where does that value come from? Right, like the the we've talked before about the value of human life. Um, we've talked before about, you know, like, okay, the issue of abortion, this, this, um, this informs our views, our yeah. political views on abortion. This informs our views on slavery. Yeah. The, 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 we've talked before about how men in the faith got this wrong because mm. they misunderstood the value of the image of God upon um, the individual. But that's what Genesis 1 is building up. Like, I love the parallelism that you see, you observe, uh, day one is the creation of light. Day four, the parallel is the creation of light bearers, right? Like he, God gives light, and then in day four, he gives those things which give light. Um, day two, he creates the sky, creates the waters. Day, day five, the parallel, he fills those. He puts birds in that sky in the air. He puts fish in the sea in the waters. Uh, day three, creation of dry land. Day six, the creation of land animals. And all of that stuff... The parallel, he, he, he builds up and then it points to the end of Genesis 1, and that is the creation of man. Right. Like something changes in the, in the script as you're reading through, you know, the same pattern over and over and over again, and then here comes the creation of man. And it's this, this is the crown jewel. This yeah. is what God has decided to, how God has decided to, to take his image, to place it on humanity so that we might be his image bearers and go throughout the earth and reflect the creator and reflect the glory of God. That's what our purpose yeah. is for. So, yeah, um, there's, yeah, I think that's really, it, it's incompatible with the yeah. evolutionary worldview. It's incompatible with the secular position and understanding of where we come from. Sure. So th- yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, Should we bounce into the initiative? Yeah. That time, or yeah, do you have yeah. anything you wanted to conclude with? No, I think I'll conclude in, in my initiative. Um, I, I think this is what I would say if, if I can go first yeah. in the initiative. Um, TJ, I'll allow that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I was thinking about this as I was as I was kind of studying and preparing, and um, you, you, you want to ask this question: What is the purpose of Genesis chapter one? Right? Like, why do I? Why do? Why is Genesis one included? Because we mentioned this is a grace that God has given us. He didn't have to put this in Scripture. He didn't have to reveal this to us. Um, And I think Genesis chapter 1 is not designed to be some scientific textbook that answers all the questions about the origin and the timeline of all creation. But what Genesis 1 teaches us is that God is the creator of the world. He has been established that. 
and man was created with an, an intentional purpose um, to reflect God's glory. And so when I think about Genesis 1, I see the creative power of God, the active and immediate decrees of God coming into play, and I see the purpose for which I was created all packed into those powerful six literal days. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I think um, my initiative would be that if I'm 100% confident in how God created Genesis 1, Genesis 2, I can be 100% confident in how God will end the story. Mm-hmm. I trust how God began the story, and I, I can trust how God ended it, mm-hmm. right? Like, I've got complete confidence in Genesis 1 and 2, but I also have complete confidence in Revelation 21 and 22 that the redeemed, those who were saved by the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ will be united with God for eternity oh in a newly created heaven and earth. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, confi- I'm confident. Yeah. Yeah, I'm confident yeah. in that. Um, and um, and you're I'm confident in that based on Genesis one. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Gosh, that's so good, man. I. I wish we could talk for hours and hours and hours about part creation. Two this. We're Man, part there's two and there's three. so much there's so much that we haven't touched, um, yeah. but the 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 point what we tried to accomplish here is kind of dealing with some of those um, questions that are related to creation um, that we just we have to ask we have to deal with but man that was fun yeah. I love yeah. I love I love talking about that stuff but uh, if you're not doing so already make sure you're subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and to our YouTube channel go on there comment uh, review us rate us uh, give us any kind of feedback make sure you like us on Facebook at Reformed Informants follow us on Instagram and Twitter at r underscore informants and don't forget you can find links to all of our social media platforms, previous episodes, all of that available at our new website at www.themajestiesmen.com backslash reformed informants. Yeah, if you have questions, suggestions, or topics of discussion that you want us to try and tackle and get after, feel free to email us at reformedinformants at gmail.com.